So I want to be a support to pastors because I realize too that with the rise of social media, we have people being discipled by people who may or may not be biblically sound and the pastor may not even be aware of how that even happened. Elisa, uh, so good to sit with you today and have you share your story. Um, I want to just start with a little bit of that story. Like you were in Zoe Girl, you have this uh, incredible journey into music and the music industry, you're a Dove Award winner, and then your faith got rocked and that really drove uh, you to find answers. And I want you to tell, just give us your story. Tell us yeah. a little bit about that and how the Lord used um, that crisis of faith to draw you close to Him. Yeah, he, well, he sure did. So I grew up in a Christian home, had great Christian parents who gave me the gospel, involved me and my sisters in a lot of uh, homeless ministry. And uh, my dad would take us out to the streets of Hollywood and Los Angeles, and we would evangelize. I'd pass out gospel tracts. So I met a lot of people from different worldviews, but I just knew Christianity was true. And I knew deep in my bones that the Bible was God's word. And so I, I read almost the whole Bible by the time I was 12 years old, just loved God, loved his word. And, and so that was really never challenged meaningfully in an intellectual way till I was an adult. I went through uh, high school and even throughout my young adult years in ministry, doing all the mission trips with church, doing all the things. You know, I was that kid in youth group that was just totally sold out for the Lord. And as you mentioned, went into contemporary Christian music. And then it really wasn't until Zoe Girl came off the road somewhere around 2007, 2008. And my husband and I started attending a church right in the heart of the Bible Belt where we were living in the Nashville area. And we really loved this church. And after attending there about eight months, the pastor of the church invited me to take part of what he described to be an inner circle type study and discussion group. He mm. said, this is going to be kind of like going to seminary. And that sounded really exciting to me because I really hadn't done that kind of work. I knew what the Bible said and I loved God's word, but I hadn't really been given the tools to interpret it properly or know even why we consider these to be the books of the Bible mm -hmm. and why these are and some aren't. I just didn't know the answers to It's a real honor. Yeah, yeah. I was really excited. And so I showed up to the first class with my Bible, my notebook, my pen. And it was in the context of that first class that the pastor revealed to this very exclusive group that he was actually an agnostic. And that, of course, surprised me. And red flags are going up. He's the lead pastor of this church. The lead pastor, yes. And so I thought, well, I don't want to be judgmental. Maybe he's just being really open. Maybe he's struggling and we can come alongside him and encourage him. Uh, but what I was really unprepared for was that the class was really coming from the perspective of skepticism. And what I didn't know at the time that I would only learn later after he made a series of videos about it is that at that time, he had already deconstructed his faith and was trying to get his parishioners into deconstruction so that he could convert them to progressive Christianity. And he was really, really good at it. And Would you define that a little bit? What is progressive Christianity? Yeah, so progressive Christianity is it's a bit hard to define because it's very fluid. It's very There's a broad spectrum of beliefs that fall under that umbrella. But the most simple way I could put it is that it's people who are basically embracing the conclusions of theological liberalism, adding a little bit of postmodernism to it. In other words, rejecting the idea that an absolute truth could be known about religion and morality. And yet they're still calling themselves Christians and even in some cases, evangelical Christians. Appreciating Jesus as maybe a, a, an entity to be idealized, but not deity. Uh, yes. Now, some progressive Christians would not deny the deity of Jesus, but they might define it maybe in a more panentheistic way. In other words, like the, everything is divine. There's there's divinity in all created matter. Uh, so it, it gets a little sticky. But I think most simply, it's just it's Christianity that has progressed beyond Jesus. Really, it's it's be, it's progressing as we go along. And progressive Christians believe that um, that the people who were the eyewitnesses of Jesus' life, the apostles he commissioned that in the mind of the progressive, this represents Christianity in its infancy, much like a baby that's learning to crawl before it walks. So as we evolve, we can look back, make corrections. We have more revelation, more knowledge about God today. So it's it's literally the view that Christianity is progressive. It's a more enlightened Christianity in their minds. In their minds, yes. Yeah. 
I would say that's true. So, so he had already he had already embraced all of that and was trying to get his congregation into into deconstruction. And so, what ended up happening is I would try to debate him while I was in the class, but it wasn't until my husband and I left that church, and then I was kind of isolated. I had I had a toddler and a new baby. And then all of those doubts that were planted took root in my heart and grew. And so I, I got to the point where I was pretty double-minded. I was convinced mm. intellectually that everything I believed my whole life wasn't true, but my heart knew it was. I knew Jesus. I'd walked with him my whole life. So I, I vowed that I was going to get to the bottom of this. And so I cried out to the Lord one night and just said, God, if you're real, if everything I've believed about you is true, I need information. And God was so faithful to answer that prayer and lead me to the study of apologetics and history and hermeneutics and all sorts of things that I didn't even know were out there. This rich intellectual history to our faith. And really, God rebuilt my faith over the course of several years. And I made course corrections along the way. Um, but I'm very thankful to be here with you today because I now have the opportunity to maybe help other people who feel the confusion that I felt when I was in that class. Well, and what you're speaking to is really what Paul warned the Ephesian church of in Acts 20, that fierce wolves would come That's into right. the church from within the church and lead it astray. I mean, a pastor who's agnostic but putting on a mask of faithful Bible teaching, that's a dangerous thing. Yeah. And so you're trying now really to help the church uh, unmask those false doctrines yeah. and, and talk a little bit about how that's going. Right. So it's, you know, in God's sovereignty, I can look back and, and think, my goodness, that timing was perfect. Because back then, a lot of the progressive Christian leaders were still kind of talking out both sides of their mouths. Honestly, there was a lot of, well, hey, no, we still believe the Bible is this or that. And they were saying a lot of the right things. Whereas I think today, fast forward, it's been <clears throat> a little over 10 years, they're really all out and open now about what they truly believe. Yeah. And it's been very, it's been a, a very difficult thing for a lot of Christians to navigate what's true, you know, how do I even know? Because a lot of those voices now have really big platforms. Yeah. And then there's even these pop level influencers who have even more influence that are promoting some of those same lies, but they aren't really couching them in theological terms. And so it's really in the wild now. It's just, yeah. it's everywhere. Talk a little bit about the influence that a pastor has on a congregant. Because here you are, I mean, you, you are impressionable uh, you, and you have a desire to know the word. Um, you're kind of the ideal congregant. You know, I'm thinking back to my pastoral days, like somebody who wants to hear the teaching of the word, learn deeper hermeneutics. Yeah. You want to study deeply. Talk about the influence that that pastor can have. It's... It, I don't think it could exaggerate the influence because, you know, I mentioned growing up, I did a lot of what we called street evangelism, where I met lots of different people from different worldviews, people who said very similar things that my pastor said, even at a young age. Mm -hmm. So when I would meet an agnostic on Hollywood Boulevard and they say, well, the Bible's been corrupted or Jesus wasn't really raised from the dead, it was so easy for me to just dismiss what they said because I thought, well, they're not a Christian. They don't know. Maybe the Holy Spirit hasn't revealed this to them or they just don't believe the Bible is true. So I could just move on to the next person. And it didn't really affect my own faith very much. But this was a pastor who had spent eight months winning my trust, my respect. I respected him a lot. He was an incredibly eloquent Bible teacher. He used so much scripture in his sermons. And I really thought he and I were on the same page. So that's why for the first couple of months even in class, I was so confused because I thought, you know, I even thought, is he trying to teach us how to spot deception? It was so confusing because yeah. I couldn't believe what he was saying in this class that was so different from what he was saying on Sunday. So the influence of having that spiritual leader, mentor type person promoting these things, it's, it was just tremendous. And that's why, again, the New Testament teaches a pastor should guard his life and doctrine yeah. carefully. Talk a little bit, um, like, I'm just curious, as you look back and evaluate that situation and that pastor, what, I mean, I know you can't read his heart, but what, what do you feel like his motivation was? Did that ever get revealed? Like, what yeah. was the motivation for that? that yeah, for, for a long time, I just, I, I tried to give him the benefit of the doubt and just think, well, I guess he was just trying to figure things out. But he actually did create a video just a couple of years ago mm -hmm. commenting on that time. And he was very clear that he had already deconstructed. He was already a progressive Christian, even though he was still giving fairly biblical sermons on Sundays. And his hope was to deconstruct his his parishioners. He wanted to convert them to this more progressive type of Christianity. He was just doing it very slowly. So he didn't actually fully come out 
uh, and, and reveal what his true beliefs were until about six or seven years after my husband and I left the church. So there were a lot of people that for many years were just in a lot of confusion from things he would say behind the scenes versus what he would say from the pulpit on a Sunday. What a grace that God protected both you and your husband, because one of you could have gone yeah. deeper in the faith and one astray. Um, so that's a neat reality that the Lord protected you guys. I want to ask this question. Um, how do you hope today uh, to come alongside pastors with your ministry, with your podcast um, and your writing ministry? I mean, you were, you're writing tons of books. You just put one out uh, this year, I believe, uh, or just this last year on uh, the different lies in the culture. Yeah. Um, and you have another one coming out. But talk about how do you hope to come alongside pastors to help people discern lie from truth and truth from almost truth? Yeah. Th thank you for that question, because I do have such a heart for pastors, because I can't even imagine being a pastor in today's climate, in today's culture. I can't imagine how difficult, I mean, the, the types of issues that pastors are having to disciple their people through are so totally different than the issues even when I was a little girl and the complications and the nuances of all of that. So I really do hope that the material that I put out is helpful to pastors and that it comes alongside them to really help with that discipleship component. Because I realize that what I do is a lot of the what, like here's what it is, here's why it's wrong, here's how to answer it. But I realize too that pastors are the ones that actually walk their people through having to you know, discern these types of things. And so I wanna be a support to pastors because I realize too, that with the rise of social media, we have people being discipled by people who may or may not be biblically sound and the pastor may not even be aware of how that even happened, especially I think when it comes to women and women's ministry, there are so many progressive Christian women have these big platforms yes. and they're very relatable. They, they identify a lot of the struggles that you might actually feel as a woman. And that brings you in to say, wow, you know, I feel that same way. But the problem is, is that in so many cases, the answers that they're giving are leading women into sin. They're leading women into a dependence on their own flesh and their own desires. In fact, that's why I wrote the book you mentioned, Live Your Truth and Other Lies, because there are so many messages that are built upon the idea that objective truth can't be known when it comes to religion and morality, and that people are inherently good. And that's the message. That's what so many of these platforms are telling people, and I think in particular women, mm -hmm. telling them you're perfect just as you are. So when you look inside your own heart, what you find in there is gonna be good and you should live that out, right? And that's really what live your truth is yeah. all about, that slogan that we see. But as Christians, of course we know that when we dig down inside of our hearts and identify our desires, at least a lot of those are going to be in contradiction to what is actually good as Deceitfully defined by wicked. scripture. Exactly. Yeah. So trying to help people understand like our hearts are deceitful. Mm -hmm. We can't trust those things, but we do have the objective standard of truth in the scripture. And so I hope to, to lead people to that and to rest in that. And, and also just to point out the practical ramifications of that. I mean, think about culture where people feel the pressure to go on social media to check and see what everybody thinks today because what everybody thought five minutes ago will get you canceled now. And so it's like this hamster wheel, but the but planting your feet on the eternal truths of God's word that never changes actually will bring you more peace in your life because you don't have to be dependent on how rapidly changing everybody else is. You, you talk a little bit um, in that book. I mean, you had, there's probably 15 or plus lies that you're addressing. And what I'm curious about is how how do you start to evaluate an emerging lie? You know, I think, I think the idea of uh, live your truth, that's really emotionalism, right? Like you're essentially mm -hmm. saying the word of God isn't the sufficient authority anymore. My emotions are. So live that out. And a new, but you it takes time to kind of identify that when you just hear a term or a slogan. How are you doing that? How are you coming to the point where you can say, that is a cultural lie and we need to address that as the church? Mm. Well, I think this is the task of discernment that God gives every Christian, right? And thankfully he's given us his word to go to and compare these things to. But just take the slogan, you are enough. I mean, it sounds kind of ambiguous. It sounds like the thing you'd want to say to somebody. Yeah. And so I understand why it can be confusing. I understand why people might be going, hmm, that sounds good, especially like if they have somebody in their life who has had a lot of lies spoken over them. If somebody has told you, you know, you're nothing, you'll never be anything, you're worthless. I can see why saying you are enough could feel like the right thing to say, but that's where we have to say, okay, let's pause. Let's go to scripture and see if that really is a life-giving message, if that's a truthful message. 
Because what we'll discover is that, yes, we are, we are not worthless, right? Mm -hmm. We have all been made in the image and likeness of God. That is huge. But there's a big but in Genesis 3, right? This is where Adam and Eve rebelled mm -hmm. against God, introduced sin and death into the world. And through Adam, death spread to all men. And so we have a problem where that image has been distorted by sin. Yeah. And so I think, honestly, with all the cultural lies, if you just filter it through, does this slogan assume that people are inherently good or does it assume that there's something that needs to be fixed? Mm -hmm. There's something broken, something wrong with people. And that's a huge way to spot because all of the ones like God just wants you to be happy. You are enough. You're perfect just as you are. You should trust your heart. All of those are built on the idea that you're good. Yeah. You're naturally good. So you should trust what you find inside yourself. Mm -hmm. And that's so opposite from the biblical message, which is your heart is deceitful and wicked and insanity is in the hearts of men throughout their lives, the Bible says. Yeah, you're walking through the Romans road, all of sin, yes. all fall short. Like that doesn't yes. quite jive. Yeah. The slogans are an interesting way to get into uh, a person's mind with a lie. Interestingly, uh, so is music. And yeah. you probably saw that to some degree uh, and, and not to call out any particular musician or anything, but ha talk a little bit about that, the insidiousness of how really good music yeah. can carry, uh, you know, just very carefully a, a, a dishonest message about God and us as humans. And yeah. how have you seen that? Mm, this is a big question. Like I have to like rein myself in here because <laughs> I've been thinking about it so much. But yeah, my I mean, listen, I want to say... From the beginning, there are some wonderful people in the music industry. I met so many lifelong friends that I'm still friends with that love Jesus with all their hearts. So I'm not saying that everybody who works in the Christian music industry is corrupt or not a Christian. Right. But one thing people really have to understand about the contemporary Christian music industry is that it's really not at bottom a Christian place. Mm. It's it, it has the label Christian. A lot of these labels started out as Christian labels, and they still carry that title, but they've all been bought by major secular companies who have mm. certain you know, bottom lines that they have to fulfill. So even by the time that I was in CCM, the emphasis on what type of a song you would even write or put out was not on biblical faithfulness. I mean, of course, they didn't want to rock the boat. They wouldn't have wanted to offend the radio people. So there were things like that in place. But it really was ultimately, what are people into? And let's write a song that, that matches that. And so at the time I was there, some of the messages were good, you know, that, that still I think kind of biblical and some were not. But um, in fact, I look back at some of our music and I cringe. I've even talked to the other two girls and we all have cringe songs that we've talked about theologically now that we've grown more and say, oh, I wish we would not have said that. But, um, but it really wasn't based on biblical faithfulness. And so today what we see is many, 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 many people in the contemporary Christian music industry, including artists and execs, are um, like fully affirming of LGBTQ plus and mm. that whole paradigm. They're all on the cultural train as far as it would go to all sorts of things. Um, and so I think that that's one of the reasons that music ha has become that way. But it is also, you, as you mentioned, music is powerful. It can really grab your heart and your emotions. Yeah. And so I think that's why it's even more important that as singers and songwriters, we need to write theologically, not just sound, but robust songs, mm. because that's what people, it's like a catechism. That's what catechizes the church. And there are a lot of really vapid theological songs that are catechizing the church right now, sadly. Mm. Uh, Lisa, I'm so glad you're here. Uh, final word from you to pastors, if you could encourage them in one thing as they're trying to strengthen the faith of the flock, mm. what would it be? Mm. I just would hope to encourage every pastor out there and I know you know this, but just to always do what you do for an audience of one, right? Faithfulness to Jesus is the most important thing. And you might be getting pressure from wherever, from culture, even from elders, from whoever it might be, to compromise on biblical truth. And I just hope to encourage you to just recalibrate that and say, look, I am doing everything I do to be faithful to Jesus, come what may, whatever that may mean. And like I said before, I have so much compassion for what pastors are having to deal with now today in culture. Um, you mentioned that I have a book coming out in January called The Deconstruction of Christianity. And I've really written that book specifically with pastors in mind. This is not the book you're gonna give to the person who's deconstructing. This is the book you're gonna give to their pastor, their parents, their loved ones, their spouse. And it's to really help the church understand 
this phenomenon that we're seeing of deconstruction. And we even have a whole chapter on advice where we run through all sorts of different types of relationships and how you might go about interacting with someone who's deconstructing in your life. So I'm really praying that that will be a helpful resource to pastors as well. Hey pastor, thanks for watching this video. The Focus Pastor is here to encourage you, your family, and the church. So if you like this video, hit the like button, leave a comment, or subscribe to our channel. You can also follow us on social media or check out our website.